welcome to the Writer's Block, proudly presented by Tchotchkes Bar and Grill. Got a case of the Mondays? Try some shrimp poppers, pizza shooters, or extreme fajitas. Tchotchkes, dining with flair. I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, Ringo award-winning creator of fine comics like Aberrant, Banjax, and The Jump, The Other Voice in the Dark, The Man in the Box to the Left this time is... David Abalone, uh, filmmaker, comics guy, and uh, yeah, I think we're going to stick with Coffee Achiever. Coffee Achiever, mm. I dig it. If you missed any of our previous conversations, episodes featuring comic luminaries like David F. Walker, Matt Fraction, Stan Sakai, Kevin Eastman, Cecil Castellucci, Alex DeCampi, and many, many more, our entire catalog can be celebrated via YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of worthwhile ear crack, so double on back and check it all out. But as always, we have a great uh, show for you today. Avalone, uh, bring the guests on. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Fairgray. I do not think I can match that kind of energy. <laughs> and Ed LaRoche. <laughs> LaRoche? LaRoche? How am, I, how am I pronouncing that, Ed? LaRoche is perfectly fine. Excellent. Excellent. I want to say I, before uh, we start... I, 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 go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I beg to differ, Richard, because uh, we were talking about McDonald's uh, 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 in the green room, and you were extremely excited about your free McFlurries. So. That is true. That is very true. <laughs> if there's anything that got me prepped to do my, my intro, it was your McDonald's enthusiasm. So uh. I, I also <laughs> want to say, as a sign of where we're at over here this morning, uh, two hours ago, I patted my coffee percolator on the head and said, I love you, with absolutely no irony. I did it like I was talking to a pet or a uh, spouse, and I'm very disturbed. Like, I, it came out of my mouth and went, okay, I just stroked the head of a percolator and said, I love it. That's, uh, that's, that's today. So, Richard, on that note, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to try and compete with that. But while I was in the green room, I saw something on my desk and thought, "I wonder if that's food." And I ate it. And I still don't know. <laughs> was so, it from McDonald's? Because that the jury would still be out. Honestly, it tasted like fish. <laughs> so. Oh man, I don't want to. I don't know. I'm just in like a mystery world right now. Um, I just don't want to know. <laughs> I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm Richard Fairgray. I'm a uh, comic book artist and writer, originally from New Zealand, now um, living in Canada and LA at the same time, and currently stuck in a single room for the past week and a half, other than briefly going out to get my shot. Um, I do my new book. My new book came out two days ago, or a week ago when this kind of comes out. It's Black Sand Beach Book 2. Uh, do you remember the summer before? It's 192 pages of full-color comic wonder horror for kids, so if you like to terrify your children. Um, this is the first one, Are You Afraid of the Light? And you, you do need to read the first one to read the second one, or you'll just be like, what, what is going on? But um, I do that, and I do kids' books, and I do, I eat things that I find. Um, I just live a life of adventure. I like to say yes. <laughs> that's a Love that's it. a good policy. Ed, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, writer, artist, um, indie writer, artist of comic books. My latest book came out through uh, Image called The Warning. Nice. Um, yeah, I work in animation and in live action doing storyboards. That's my day job uh, while I pursue trying to come up with IP, uh, which is the long-term plan. Uh, so basically that's my life in a nutshell, you know, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles <clears throat> and uh, just on my hustle, just trying to shake my ass real hard <laughs> and, uh, you know, just trying to make it as an artist uh, in a way that uh, most guys in my position just, just don't, you know. Right. Right. Well, at, when, that's the, the the topic that we were going to start off with today uh, was uh, Ash Ass Shakery One Hundred and One. Uh, <laughs> I think that's really, you know, oh, wow. uh, we have an uh, episode title now. I love yeah, it. Yes. Step Step One: Paint Your Ass Blue, if I remember correctly. Step Two: Shake It, Shake It, Shake It. Um, so the question is, all in all seriousness. Um, I think the hardest thing when you're studying this stuff, when you're learning it, be it, you know, through any kind of classes or through real life, 
everyone tends to focus on the part where you're doing the fun bit, which is making the stuff. And they really don't want to think about the fact that 50% of the life of a professional creative person is then trying to sell that stuff, get it in front of eyes, get anyone to care about it, listen to it, what have you. No one, no one teaches you. No one in your art school says, and here's how you get on a talk show. It's like, that's not really a, that's not really a, a topic. So sometimes, uh, it, sometimes it, you said 50, sometimes it feels like 80% of it. Uh, oh, there, there is definitely, there is definitely that. And yeah. uh, there's something to be said for how much energy you put into that percentage being predictive of how much success you may or may not have. Uh, but I was curious if you guys have any thoughts, uh, Richard, we can start with you about self-promotion beyond uh, coming on uh, humble podcast. I mean, it's like no one knows what to do. Like, especially now, we don't have conventions. <clears throat> like, I'm I'm very good at selling books at a conventions. I, I at a conventions. See, I'm good with talking words. Um, I <laughs> like I I've been doing this for a long time. I had a book called Blastosaurus, and I had such a patter with Blastosaurus because I did like 200 shows selling that book over several years. And I could just like, I could move a book every three minutes and I knew how to do it. And and now I'm like, I guess I've got to reach out to podcasts and I've got to uh, try and maybe I should hire a publicist. I'm not sure. Are they any good? And every time I've ever communicated with a publicist, the first thing they say to me is, what ideas do you have for how to promote this? I'm like, oh, that's your job. I'm coming to you because I have none, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's. It's just a constant uphill battle where you have to hope that every couple of days you might gain two or three new people who might have heard of you, and then 37 times later they might think, I'll buy the thing because I've heard his name enough times. Right. Yeah, I've that's... Actually, I, 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 no, I've go ahead, I picked up your book, uh, Blastosaurus, A Golden Apple. I'm, I'm really uh, tight friends with Ryan over there. So congratulations on that. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> See, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great... It works! Thing. It's a it's Show's a great over. book and and it it does you know to the right consumer it sells itself but the trick is getting the book in front of the right consumer where they go oh hey this is this is a thing I would like and but you know you're talking about conventions which is what I always refer to as you know the retail politics the door to door salesman part of our job uh, as opposed to the bigger things which PR people are supposed to help you with and. Mm -hmm. I can't say my experience with them has been terribly different from yours. Ed, what are what are your thoughts initially on that? Well, you know, um, I don't know how to do it pre-COVID. You know, um, I've paid for ads in the Diamond catalog. I've gone to conventions. Um, I've done the hard sell. <clears throat> and I'm not sure exactly I mean, I, I think, um, I think like the first two books that I, I self published, you know, I got pretty far with those. Uh, but the experience of going with image and the sort of pipeline that, that exists when you go with an established publisher, I mean, it's night and day, you know, uh, going with image, um, I, I was able to get, you know, 17 18 interview requests for the first issue and um that's not really based on you know whether the book was good or not you know it was just basically it was an image book you know so i would say that going through an established you know company i mean there's there aren't that many uh that can get that kind of press um uh for you just because you're affiliated with them um, because, you know, I've, I've done the convention thing where, you know, you're trying to get people over to your table and they want to just say, no, they don't, they want to avoid you. They, they're, they they do not want to be sold, you know, and, um, I'm trying to sell, you know, right. and for the percentage of people that do come over, you know, I feel the pressure and do come over to, to hear my spiel. Um, it's, it's a smaller number than the people who kind of look at me and they're like, oh, no, you're trying to sell me something, you know, and it's not even it's not even connected to the product. You know, it's just the 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 energy of me trying to sell you an idea, you know, um, 
so I think maybe it's it's uh, it's a combination of uh, affiliation. Um, well, that's probably the primary way to do it is affiliation. But if you don't have that, then accumulation of of, of your work and and word of mouth. You know, the soft sell. You know, um, and how do you get word of mouth? You know, I, I don't know if if word of mouth is the same thing as getting an, uh, an interview on a, about your book. I don't know if they're the same thing because I don't know exactly how many people are swayed to buy something because they read a good review of a book, you know, uh, compared to people who just see it in the, in, in the you know, in the uh, diamond catalog and they're like, oh, this is by image or this is by uh, Devil's Do or, or something like that. And they're thinking, oh, okay, well, I like those books. Let's see what, what this what this is about. You know, I really don't have any any answers for that, especially now post COVID. I don't know what the landscape is like right now. It's it's definitely I mean, it's definitely a question mark, uh, you know, as what will conventions be like when we go back? I'm like, I can't do what Richard does. I am not. I am a terrible <clears throat> pitchman in person. <laughs> like I, I will sit, I will sit at my table and like, uh, not make eye contact <laughs> until they pick up a book in their hands. And then I say, Hey, yeah, it's, I'll talk to you about that. And I know people who do the opposite. Our good buddy, David Pepos will like, you know, throw a net around someone and drag them to a table and ask them what their favorite movies are and find the comic he has written that is like their favorite movie. It's a, it's a breathtaking thing to watch, but I, 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 I'd be dead in four hours if I tried to do that. I, it's just not my personality. The thing hey, that I'm like Calvin and Hobbes. Hey, yeah, do you like right. Calvin and Hobbes? Hey, <laughs> yeah. do you like Calvin and Hobbes? I mean, look, I, I'm not, I, I am not, I am in awe of that. I, I do not mock it. It's just, you know, there, you have to tailor your approach to who you are. Uh, you know, there's no, the world is full of comic artists who are introverts who will never overcome it and who cannot do that, who cannot do the, the hard sell. I'm interested that you say the things uh, that Image took good care of you, because that's always the part, the part with going with a publisher that's just impossible to quantify in advance is you can't get them to sign a contract that will say, we'll get you 17 interviews, we will buy this many ads for your comic, we will put this much amount of energy into selling you and a lot of times like i've seen this in hollywood with people are thrilled because some junior agent at caa took them on and i said you are now the least important client at the biggest firm in the world like do you you know they don't care about you you are the last you're gonna have to get your own jobs in order to impress them so that they will put energy into you uh, mm. And I'm glad to hear that that wasn't your experience uh, over at Image. Well, I mean, uh, the impression I got with the reviews, um, I think what happens is that there's this industry of reviews where their their main benefit is to only review the first one or two issues, and then they stop mm -hmm. reviewing the series. Oh yeah, because they get the most clicks because there's more interest about the new number one of so-and-so and such and such. So, you know, that's just like this weird uh, circumstance of, of that situation, um, which, which kind of sucks because, I mean, it, it leads to a situation where if you don't spell out the story and everything that, that it encompasses within the first issue, um, they don't get it. You know, right. and, and there are certain stories mm -hmm. where you have to read the whole thing to, to get a fuller picture of what the story is about. It's not going to be all in the first issue. You can get a right. hook in the first issue. You know, everyone's all about hooks. You know, Hollywood is all about hooks. You know, you know, what, what's the hook, you know, but, you know, you know, this is more than the, I'm trying to tell a story, here. you know, and the story is not the first chapter. Yeah. But it's, it's that association thing is, is so true because like, <clears throat> If you say you're with, it's the same as like, you can't get a book in front of a publisher until you have an agent. Your book is no better because you have an agent, but having an agent means the publishers look at you. You, mm. it, you know, your book gets paid attention to by the media, whatever, because you're with image or with whoever, but it's the same on the, on the smaller level on like social media. I know that if I post 
if I post a link to a good review on my on any any one of my pages, I will get like five times the number of likes that I would get from just a, a picture from the book or anything like that. Huge response. None of those people are reading that review though. All it is is that I am putting that review out there and that interview out there and building this like backlog of things so that when someone goes to my page or my website, they go, oh, all those other people thought he was important enough to talk about. He must be something. Mm -hmm. And it, and just, exactly. it just gets it and in their brain. And that is absolutely how Hollywood works. That's why they always want to adapt books or plays or I or comic books. Uh, you know, I've told this story before, but I couldn't get arrested as a Hollywood screenwriter for a million years. And I, my first significant work as a writer in Hollywood were, that was like, oh, you're a comic book writer. How fast? Because when I was an independent filmmaker, I was just a guy making independent films. I didn't have any imprimatur on me that anyone was paying me to do that. As a comic book writer, a movie studio production company was like, oh, someone has already taken the chance on paying this person to be a writer. Ergo, no one wants to, no one wants to put their own taste on the line. It's always like, well, I can like this because these other three people liked it. So if my boss hates it, I can go, yeah, but this guy's a published comic book writer. I had every reason to believe he would be good. Uh, it's all, it's all nonsense. And it's also why, you know, nothing succeeds like success, as the old saying goes. Um, you know, it's why, you know, any, why there are three or four showrunners on television who produce virtually everything, uh, because it it's just becomes branding. And I think one of the first things I noticed, even as a filmmaker, um, was that you have to make yourself the story you have to make yourself the star of the movie even over above. I mean, this is something Hitchcock figured out before most people that uh, it's not a Jimmy Stewart movie. It's a Hitchcock movie with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, and that's a wild thing to be able to pull, pull off in the 1950s and the 1960s to be bigger than Jimmy Stewart, to be bigger than Cary Grant. Um, well, you, can I jump in real quick? Because oh. I think what you're talking about is pretty important um, and something I like to, to sort of convey to like younger artists coming up, which is, you know, when it comes to comic books and trying to uh, present an idea or trying to create an, an IP, you know, Marvel and DC, they have these characters, right, that are, that are well known, okay, and the market is pretty, pretty much dominated by those guys. They, they make up something like 70% of the market or something like that, right? So when it comes to people who are doing it, doing it from uh, the indie comics route, all right? The percentage of pe people who want to give uh, an indie book a, sh a shot is very small. You know, the first adopters, that's a very small audience, but they could be your, your most important audience because those first adopters um, are possible. They, you know, they're necessary to create word of mouth, positive word, word of mouth. So you want to get you know, it's kind of like an influencer, right? An influencer who, who's seen as super cool and super on the pulse of things. You know, if if they get if they sign off on whatever uh, whatever you're doing, that creates the word of mouth, right? And that's the thing that a lot of firms and a lot of companies they try to replicate that, or they try to 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 co-op that dynamic of the honest first adopters appraisal and praise of whatever product that people like us are trying to make, you know, um, and then from there, hopefully over the course of time, you're able to build up a body of work. And then now you have a name, you know, and then maybe one of the big two, they hire you because now you have a name. Oh, what do you, you know, what would you do with uh, Black Panther? What would you do with so-and-so and such and such? And then you get into the bigger numbers, the bigger numbers of, of selling and working, uh, work made for hire. But I don't know if that's, that should be the goal. You know, because as an independent guy, you know, I'm a writer artist, so I don't need an artist in order to do my books. My goal is to create IP that can be sold and put, put into the process. You know, when you're working for Marvel or DC, that's not 
you know, that's not the direction that you want to go because they own all that stuff, right. you know, and as an artist writer, you, you want to, you know, ownership is what it, what it's all about. If you're going to be doing comics, you know, not, not publishing because Marvel and DC, they've got that game. So that's sewed up pretty tight, you know, right. well, you, I, you, you don't, you don't make a ton of money, uh, uh, publishing independent comic books, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, um, you know, I, I, I make my money when, you know, I'm, I, I made my money when, you know, Aberrant was optioned as a TV series and they pay me to write the pilot, you know, uh, um, that's, nice. that's how it works, you know, um, uh, that's, I, I mean, wh what I keep hearing here and I, I just, you know, everybody's kind of saying it, but I want to hit it right on the head is that this thing is almost like a, it's like a snowball rolled down the mountain. Right. And it just kind of, picks up more and more mass as it goes down the longer you do this and if you're doing it right it's almost like the larger your reach get the gets mm -hmm. the bigger your fan base gets the the more people you can call upon uh uh you know I, I mean i remember i mean dropping my first book it was really hard to get those reviews right um and i really had to work hard really had to beg people but it's gotten easier and easier each time i have a new book coming out in august that hasn't been announced yet but um mm -hmm. But now I have a list of people that I can just go to, you know, I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, somebody posted a review, I created a relationship with that person, I shared the hell out of the review. So, you know, people were driven to the website, I did interviews with the website, uh, promotional things at the website, I, I, ha I have, you know, not only built a fan base of readers, but a fan base of, of journalists who will take a look at whatever it doesn't mean they're in my pocket necessarily, but it means that I can I can go to them and say, hey, here, here, I have this, what do you think about it? And if they like it, they'll write something about it and they'll and they'll put it up there. Um, and so I think that that is the way to look at it is that it's very much a marathon. People try to think of this as a sprint. Oh, I didn't get anything this time. So fuck all this. But but it is a very long, very arduous marathon. And you have to be prepared for that. Right. I mean, I you look at it. Uh, there's Kickstarter is a microcosm of this. Right. Um uh, you look how uh, Charlie Stickney is the the co-publisher of of, uh, of Scout Comics right now, but he sort of made his name in comics, building this following on Kickstarter. And he started out with you know White Ash number one, and I think he got three hundred backers and you know twelve thousand dollars on issue one of that. And then the next time it was five hundred backers and seventeen thousand. And I think this last time he had seventeen hundred backers and whatever it was, fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Each time it gets bigger, it gets badder. And then like you're saying, Ed Scout Comics says, Hey, this guy's doing something pretty interesting. He knows this promotional game. He sees where comics are going in the future. Why don't we bring him on and have him run our company? <laughs> you know? Um uh so this thing gets built out over time and I and I think that that that's interesting. And and the other point that keeps popping into my head is um I mean and I'm interested in hearing what you guys have tried that hasn't worked, but it's something I've noticed is that it becomes really hard to figure out where to put your time. Time is a finite resource, right? Um, it, you know, it's, it, I'm, it's what Avaloni is saying is like, so as a creator, you're spending at least 50% of your time, you know, promoting stuff r r right now. I have, to, I have two comics going to, 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 uh, to printers right now. I have, um, I just finished up a Kickstarter and so I got to get that book in order. I got to get it to a, I got to get it to the printer. I also have this book, this book, this, you know, it's a four issue arc that's about to come out in comic shops and I'm in the process of getting all those files ready for the, uh, for the publisher and going back and forth and implementing notes. So right now I'm not writing at all. The last like month of my, uh, of my creative life has, has been editing and proofing files and all of that stuff. I'm not a writer right now. Um, and that can be frustrating. So again, time is such a finite resource. And so when you're trying to promote something and I'm, I'm about to have to, you know, promote this book going into comic shops, it is very difficult to learn like, okay, well, where do I put my time? What is worth my time? Cause you can spend a shit ton of time doing stuff that brings back no return. Um, the greatest example of this is, uh, we go back to our, our old friend, David Pepos, uh, uh, that Avaloni was just mentioning. Um, he and I had books coming out at around the same time. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think exactly how it, I think maybe I had Banjax coming out and he had, um, going to the chapel going out, uh, right. And, and so, or maybe going to the chapel came out a little bit after, uh, after Banjax, but, but here's the comparison is that David Pepo spent a week of his life, like 12 hour days calling individual comic shops saying, hey, I'm David Pepos, I have this book coming out, blah, 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 blah. He's really good at this. We all know that. He's the best at it. He's the best at calling someone and getting them to buy his book, right? 
And so he literally called a thousand comic shops, no exaggeration, over the course of a week and said, hey, I'm David Pepos. I'd like you to order this. Let me send you a, a PDF, all of that stuff, right? Um, I did absolutely none of that <laughs> with Banjax. I did not call a single comic shop. Um, I did some other stuff. Pepos also did that. Um, if you go to Comicron and you look up uh, uh, initial comic shop orders for Banjax number one and going to the chapel number one, they're identical. He spent a week calling a thousand comic shops and we had identical orders. Uh, they're both, they were both critical hits. They were both thought of it as successes. You know, they're, they're, they're very comparable in a number of ways. Uh, calling a thousand comic shops did not move the needle. Uh, and, and that can be terrifying, right? So like there was this learning curve where over years you figure out what works and what doesn't, what is worth your time and what doesn't. So, so give me some thoughts on that stuff. That is wild. I was, I like, Halfway through that story, I had a lot of thoughts. Right? <laughs> that went a really different way than I expected. And like, I mean, I think I think all all three of you and 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 David Pepos as well. Like, I mean, actually, Ed, I don't I don't know you well enough to 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 say this, but like you said earlier, you, you want to create IP. Like, I've never thought about creating something as IP. I've always thought of things as just making something. And uh, any time I've kind of flirted with that idea of going down the IP route, I just get really unhappy about it and, uh, and, and hate doing it. And I think like that's, I don't, that's not good or bad. It's just, a, it's, it's just a, a, a different thing. But I mean, like there are things like you can look at, you can look at David Pepos's works and you can like the, the reason he's able to put it into one sentence and get people over to a table is because his works are, they actually are. What if this thing was crossed with this thing? He does really, he really thinks like he gets, he's so excited by pop culture. He's so excited by the things he already loves. Putting them together and making a new thing is like his favorite thing to be doing. Um, and of course things like that are going to be an easier sell. And then that, that was the thought I was having along the way. I was like, yes, this, these calls probably made a difference, but if, if, if his work was so much more popular than popular than yours, it's probably because going to the chapel can be sold as the two things that it is a combination of that a lot of people already like and Banjax does not have that behind it. But then you say they're the same sales. So I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> Well, I mean, you get back to the William Goldman thing. Nobody knows anything, and there's no, and there's also something to be said for that. You do that same experiment a month later with two other comic books, and it comes out the complete opposite way. And Banjax doesn't sell a thing. You know what I mean? I don't know that you can derive any lessons from this stuff because it's such a shifting landscape, and that's why we're all kind of stuck in this position where we do whatever we can. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking about PR people, but it's like they're supposed to be the experts that know something, but they're also faking it. We're all faking. I will say that, you know, the thing about IP versus making comic books for the sake of I, that's just a question of I think that has for me, at least I can't speak for Ed or, or Rylan. For me, at least that's just the part of my brain that plans what I'm going to do with this thing in the future. The, the spark is always, I'm going to tell a story. Uh, and sometimes the spark is a commercial one. You know, sometimes the spark is, oh, that's a, that's a, people would like that. That's a good idea. But it's never people would like that. And I hate that, but I'm going to do it anyway because people. No, and I, 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 I'm sorry. I probably, yeah. I probably sounded quite insulting. I, I really didn't no, no. intend to. Like, yeah. it's, I'm, I'm saying, like, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that way of thinking. But also, like, you guys want to do things. You guys want to work in fields that aren't comics. Like Ryland, I've heard you talk many times about like like TV scripts, getting things developed. Like you guys want to go beyond comics. I don't want to. Right. And like that's probably what's going to mean I I die penniless. But like <laughs> I don't know about all that. I want to well, do well, is yeah. Comics. well, yeah. Well, well, well. Two two things on that. I mean, one the one the comics like. TV movie connection is inescapable right now, right? Um, you know, there was a there was an IP revolution in Hollywood, uh, uh, not you know a few years back, two thousand eight or so. You know, I've, I've told this story before on here, but um, you know, I, I I got my first, you know, I got my first professional uh, writing job in Hollywood in two thousand four, 
Um, and, uh, and it was kind of off to the races after that. And at that point, if you wrote a, if you wrote a good script and it went out, it would sell. That was just what happened. You wrote a spec script, you went and sold it. Um, and then the, uh, and then the financial crisis happened, uh, right around the time of the, the writer's strike and Hollywood, uh, uses, you know, as an excuse to kind of remake the way they do business overnight, they were making about a third as many films as they were making, uh, uh, you know, the, the year before, uh, all of the, the indie money in Hollywood dried up. Um, the independent film movement kind of moved on to television, uh, onto streamers mostly. And, and that became a, a big ugly quagmire. Well, you know, I, I, I had a, well, what was happening at the same time was, there was this IP revolution, right? Where suddenly in Hollywood, everything had to be based on something, you know, a, a, a book, a video mm. game or, or a comic book. And now it is almost primarily comic books, right? And so mm. I had a few lean years in Hollywood uh, after doing pretty well those first couple of years. And finally I got smart and I'm like, well, if they want IP, like, why don't I just give them IP? You know, and I, I think Ed is describing the, the same thing. And so what I did, where I started, you know, back in whatever it was, 08 or something like that was, I had an idea that I would have written as a movie initially, uh, uh, but I knew I couldn't sell it as a spec or a pitch to save my life. And so, so again, uh, you know, wanting to like pay my rent at the time and, and keep food on the table, I wrote it instead as a short story. I got the short story published and then overnight we had a bidding war. You know, I wouldn't have been able to sell this in a million years as a spec, but suddenly I read it as a short story and we have Justin Lin on one side coming off uh, uh, the Fast Six premiere. Uh, uh, which was the largest uh, opening in, in Universal Summer history at the time, might still be. And then we had uh, Brett Ratner and Robert De Niro on the other side in a bidding war. And Tyler Perry came in and, and made a, 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 an offer on this and, and all these things. And so, um, and so my reps at the time thought it was a fluke. They're like, you know, I mean, they didn't kind of see the writing on the wall. And I'm like, it's not a fluke, watch this. And then I proceeded to do it again, like five or six times with short stories. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just sold a TV series to Lionsgate and it's based on one of those short stories that I, that, that I wrote uh, uh, way back when. So it's like, so it's inescapable, but I think that we've talked about this before. I mean, I, I think there is a danger in like, there is a danger in, you know, just you know in, in taking your movie script and turning it into a a, a comic book right that, that is a recipe for for disaster but i think above all what we've all identified is that we're all we are just storytellers right mm. um and I, I i think particularly with the stories that i write and that ed writes like we write big hollywood type stuff like you know in in, in hollywood makes like what a half dozen of those every year maybe and so if ed and i sat here and just tried to churn out big sci-fi screenplays or something like that they would go nowhere um so we have these stories to tell we want to tell them and 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 we are used to writing a screenplay and having it sit on a shelf for a decade so we need to figure out another way to tell that story and so the beauty of going to comics is you make it into a comic and then it exists and if it goes nowhere after that Someone has written this great story that you've told, right? Uh, uh, and, and 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 like and 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 you can finally die happy because like it's out into the world. But then there is this added aspect of well, you know, Hollywood is gobbling these things up. So chances are, like, it mutates. It becomes something different. It becomes a TV series. It becomes a movie. It becomes whatever. And right now, that's kind of the only way into the the, the, the Hollywood system. So. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, what I have found over the years, I started out as a screenwriter um, and then and, and, and did well for a while. And then it got impossible to just be a screenwriter. And, you know, I went to the American Film Institute Conservatory with like 144 of the most talented people that, uh, that, that, that I've ever met in my life. And I would say 140 of them, 135 of them are fucking back in Pennsylvania selling insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's, not but what they wanted. it's not what they wanted. Right. And so mm -hmm. the people that stayed learned to adapt. They, mm -hmm. they mutated, they, they became writers, uh, in, in, instead of, uh, instead of screenwriters, uh, uh, they became storytellers like, well, whoever will take me, whether it's fiction or, or, or I'm going to find a way to tell the story in that medium that that's appropriate mm -hmm. for that medium. They became content makers. They, uh, they, they became all these things. It's like, okay, well, they won't let me direct films. Let me direct commercials for a couple of years and then they'll let me direct films, right? Um, it's all about kind of finding the back door, finding the way over the fence, all of these things. And so you have to fucking hack the system right now or it will eat you alive, you know? Yeah, I, I think that that's just, that's the thing that I, 
I think I'm, I'm always going to be bad at it because I, I don't, I, I just, I don't want the same thing. Like I, I actually, when people say this would be a good TV show, I say, okay, if you want to go, if you want to go make a TV show, you can, I'm going to stay here though. Like it's, it, 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 again, this is a bad plan I have. But my plan is to, <laughs> to not make TV or film. But honestly, it's good to know what it is that you care about and don't care about. I mean, 20 Absolutely. years ago, I don't think I would have been as – in 2002, I got a huge opportunity to be a comic book writer. And it didn't work out for a lot of reasons. But one of those many, many reasons is I wasn't ready and I wasn't actually that interested. I was interested in having a gig. But the offer was from Marvel, and they were like, what would you do with our characters? What would you create for our universe? And I was like, eh, what's Nick Fury doing these days? Like, I, <laughs> I didn't really. And they were like, that's the wrong ad. Like, people, we, we want people who are excited about Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four and the X-Men. Being excited about writing Nick Fury is maybe not the way into being a best-selling Marvel writer. Yeah. Um, so it's So there's a lot, you know. We there are there are always versions of that. There are there are things that might have been successful that have been passed into my hands and I have turned down. Uh, and I think smarter people than I have said about those things, like, yeah, but with with me on board, would it have been a success? Would it have been the same thing? One of the things that I wanted to bring up earlier, just to connect to something Ed said about you know going to work for Marvel, what does that do for you? As a, I have seen people. Uh, I'm, I always get his name wrong, so I'm not going to try it even, but I know a Marvel writer who did a Kickstarter with a friend of mine and it got a huge number of backers, followers, made a ton of money. And I was just kind of like, I've never heard of this guy. Why is, and I looked and he had written like a run of Spider-Man and I'm like, that's all it takes to tack another 50,000 eyes on your yeah. Kickstarter is the word Spider-Man. Well, it's a hyphenated word, so it is one word. Uh, you know, like, that's literally all it... Because I was like, this is a good premise, it's a good story, it's got my friend drawing it, it's going to be great. But I was like, what? Where did this get these savage numbers? I mean, it's a, it's a Dracula story set during the Crusades, which is a high concept for someone like me who loves those things, but I don't know that the comic book reading world at large is like... Oh, medieval horror romance. That's fantastic. That's my cup of tea. It's like, not really. Mm. But I think a bunch of spider fans were like, oh, I like everything this guy does. Awesome. And that's great. And that is using that, you know, those eyes. Another thing Ed said earlier, you know, you're, you're, the biggest people that you need to get in the world are the, are the you know, the Ed LaRouche hipsters. You know, mm -hmm. you... You want the people who say I was into David Avalone before it was cool because those are the people that are out there evangelizing for you. And, you know, I've never done the thing Pepos has done, but I've talked about this before where whenever I travel, I find the comic book store in whatever town I'm in and I go in, sign what they've got, shake a hand, you know, see a face to face. And you hope those people keep an eye on your stuff in, in previews and maybe order it when it comes across their their plate, but it's, you know, that part is completely a mystery, you know? You know, um, there's another part of the process, which I don't think um, anyone is really kind of getting into, which is like uh, how to live as a creative, you know, in regards to, it, it touches all of the subjects that we're talking about now, you know, which is, you know, all the possibilities all the options, um, but at the same time, still being creative throughout all of mm -hmm. those things, you know. Um, and there were there, there used to be a lot of uh, art movements that kind of laid down the philosophical tenets of, you know, what you're creating within the parameters uh, that they kind of uh, lay out, you know, how you make it, you know, uh, what it's supposed to be. Um, uh, and we're, we're not at a time where you have probably more artists on the planet than has probably ever existed. We don't have a way of being an artist, you know, like, so, so for instance, you know, like 
trying to make IP is, is a way of creating a situation where you can maintain mm. uh, being able to still be a, a creative and an artist, you know, um, being able to sort of divvy up your time and figuring out what's important and what's not important and still at, at the end of the day, going back to the drawing table or the, the keyboard, you know, and still being able to sort of stick to that through line of being a creative and dealing with all the other things that are attached to it, you know, that could totally t take you off of your, your creative, uh, your, your, your creative uh, stance or, you know, like, so for instance, even reviews, you know, if you get reviews or if you don't get reviews or if you get negative reviews or you get positive reviews, all those things can knock you off of your creative uh, foundation, you know, because it's, it's such a delicate thing to be able to get into a creative mind space, you know, and, you know, when you, when you think about like uh, all the things that you have to do and whether they work or don't work, a lot of that stuff is kind of out of your hands. You know, all you can really totally control is the work, you know, so, so do the work. And at the same time, realize that you have to do all these other things if you want to maintain a situation where you can continue to do the work, you know. Um, and that's that, that's not even a formula for success. That's just a, for, a formula for being an artist in this contemporary times, mm -hmm. you know, and and not getting to a place where you're like, OK, well, uh, my last book didn't I didn't get one review or something like that. So fuck it. I'm going to just go do Starbucks or I'm going to go work at something else. No, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, if you're doing stuff like what we're doing right now, it's more than just a casual thing. You know, there's better ways, easier ways of making money. You, you know, you're obviously, you know, it's a calling you're possessed, you have to do it. So how do you do it? And, uh, maintain, the conditions in which you can continue to do it because if you're lucky you know you get one sh you know you get one iron in the fire and it goes but nine times out of ten you have to have 10 15 20 irons in the fire before you get the one shot you know mm -hmm. so how do you maintain not only your ability to create not only to be able to control the conditions in which creation is possible but the psychological minefields and the and the, the 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 peaks and the highs of dealing with the lows after the peaks. You know, once you know, everyone says, "Oh, the, this was great," and then now they go away, and you're sort of like, "Okay, now it's just me and the and the and the keyboard and 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 the and the drawing uh, room." You know, it's like there's a lot of things going on in you know uh, in in the process of creativity that basically have to be sort of like um, dealt with in a, in a roundabout way. Yeah. No, it's a, the, the lifestyle of someone who does this stuff for a living, any kind of art for a living. I always talk about, you know, my dad was a novelist who wrote over 200 published novels, worked, nice. worked pretty constantly, only briefly, you know, never made him a rich man. We had good years and we had terrible years. Uh, but I remember, uh, you know, his, his diaries were an open book. He did, they weren't private in any way because he was a writer and everything was for public consumption, including his diaries. And after he passed away, I was looking through one of his diaries from 72 and reading the, reading it in order. It's mostly like, you know, rain today, Mets lost, you know, that's the basic, the base, that's the basic entry. But he goes through a summer where he writes three novels between June and October. Wow. Right? Let's say October 15th, the entry is finished this book, three novel run, manuscripts in, waiting on edits, waiting on galleys, blah, 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 blah. No, no later than November 1st, the entry is nothing going on, never going to work again. You know, I'm not really a writer. And you're like, you wrote three novels over the summer. Dude, take a week. You know, take a week off and a deep breath and watch a Mets game where they win. Good luck in 73. But, you know, it was, but it's just that thing of like, as prolific as my father was, as much as he wrote every single day, he managed to get through whatever distractions there were and put some pages out. 
more consistently than anyone I've ever heard of or met. And even he is like, I got nothing going on. I'm not really a writer. You know, there's no, my career is over. At the height of his career, he was still saying, eh, nobody's reading this shit. And uh, the ability to navigate that psychosis, you know, the, when my mother always referred to postpartum depression whenever my father finished the book. <laughs> like, oh, it's, you know, he gave birth. Now he's disappointed and he won't be happy till he's pregnant again with the next book. Uh, and that's not a terrible analogy because it is an act of creation. And it is when it's over, you're like, mm, now what? What do I, mm. what the hell do I do next? I wrote an essay a few years ago, and I feel slightly differently today, but uh, called Success or the Called Bluff. And this is before I worked at, in comics, where I talked about, you know, everyone when they're a teenager says, I want to, whatever your dream is, I want to make movies. I would do anything. I'll push a broom on the set. That's, I just want to be part of the team. I want to be on it. And some people mean it, and a lot of people don't. The people who don't go back to Pennsylvania uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I, you know, I know people who came out to Hollywood and didn't last two months. Uh, and part of me goes, wow, okay. 34 years later, I'm surprised you gave up that easy. But there, you know, part of that essay was, and at the time I was mostly editing low budget films. It was like, I wake up every morning and I go to the computer and I work on, and I make movies. And it hasn't bought me a nice house and it hasn't, you know, made me rich and famous. But my goal was to make movies for a living. I make movies for a living. That's a, you got to throw that one in the wind column. And, you know, there's the old expression, uh, comparison is the thief of joy. Mm. And I've said that to so many people. Then when, you know, I, I was complaining once to a friend of mine that I hadn't directed a movie in five years. This was a long time ago. And she said, go back and say that sentence to yourself again, and then think of how many people have never and will never direct a movie, and it's the thing they most want to do on this planet. She's like, you're already in the tiny little percentile, the microscopic 0 0.001 percentile of human beings who got to do something for a living that they actually wanted to do. And I always, as much as, you know, it's, I'm tired of the two bedroom apartment. I'd like to live in a house now. But even that said, that's a choice I made. Uh, I did. There are things I could have done to make money if the house was the most important thing. Clearly, it was not. I, 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 sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm hearing my own echo. I thought I thought I was speaking over someone. Um, <laughs> It's like, what a pleasant voice that is. Um, <laughs> I, I was talking to a friend of mine about the thing that you're hearing you're, about your dad, basically that I was talking about that last night. Like in any creative industry, there is no day harder than the day where nothing goes wrong, but you had good news the day before. <laughs> because That's really great. It's, it's, it's tough. Like it's so addictive to get like, any piece of good news and then just you just plummet you know and like i have a I, I i can't quite figure out how to turn my arm around at the right angle without swiveling everything but i have a tattoo on my arm that just says don't cry work and That's i've great. had that written somewhere in every room every like every bedroom every office every place i've worked since i was like a kid because it's like that's all there is like oh that's right i'm happy when i'm making things so i just do that my dad's version of that, he had a card on his desk. I have it on my desk that says, nobody asked you to be a writer. <laughs> and I fucking love it because it's like, don't, don't cry. Don't fucking complain, man. This is, you're doing this by choice. There yeah. were a lot of other things you could have done with your life. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, this is, this is what you chose. Get about it. Do it. You know, that, that quote, uh, I think that, that's from the Dakota. Uh, the comparison is the oh yeah joy. Um, it's interesting because in a lot of weird ways, as an artist, you know, comparison is kind of like the fuel that kind of mm -hmm. gets you going. Um, you see something, you you think, oh, I could do that, you know, or or right. I have better ideas. Um, but ultimately, it's really true as a life philosophy in the sense that. 
um, you can easily get lost in disappointment if you know things aren't happening the way that you wanted them to happen or within the time frame. Um, and I guess you know ultimately you have to sort of live with those moments and and it's okay to feel depressed and it's okay mm -hmm. to feel all of these emotions that go into that kind of reality, but it's not okay to, to stop, you know? Um, so, and, and stopping for, for most serious creatives, that's, that's really not, not an option. option. Yeah. It's, it's not an option because then what, what are you going to do? Right. You're going to stop. And then drink. What? <laughs> yeah. Drink. Yeah. But drink. What, that's but about it. A lot of times when I drink, I want to work. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. Well, I yeah. Mean, the 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 comparison of the thief is jo of joy thing is always like to me. It's about who are you compare as my what the point my friend was making about directing movie is like you are comparing yourself to the hundred people in the world who do this all the time for a living. Yeah not the 7 billion people who wish they had the job and couldn't get anywhere near to it. Compare yourself to the people, to the 7 billion, yeah. not the five. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I have to tell myself that over and over again. I mean, I, I, I find myself doing it on this podcast where I, I start, I start complaining, you know, about, Oh, you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I sold this TV series and it sucks because of this, this, and this, and, and, and yeah. I, I have to back up and yeah, be go like, go back to the first part of the sentence. You yeah. sound like an asshole, you know, yeah. seriously, that that's what, you know, uh, 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 again, like if you, if you went back and you told your 15 year old self that, you know, Hey, you're, you know, you're, you're going to be exactly. prepping for your, 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 I, your, your TV series. 90, like I would have shat myself, you know, in 1990, so, I was directing a music video. It was one of my first paying directing gigs. And the night before the shoot, the producer called me up and wanted to cancel it. And I got mad and I got in my car and I was driving up Sunset Boulevard, angry and pissed off and blah, 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 blah. And right on the edge of Beverly Hills, a calm descended on me truly. And I thought, dude, this is the job you wanted. If you think the rest of your life isn't arguing with producers the night before the first day of shooting, you have no idea what the job is. If you're not okay with this part of the job, all the fun part of the job, like, yeah, everybody loves being on the set with actors and making a movie. That ain't the whole thing. A big part of the thing is driving down Sunset Boulevard at 70 miles an hour at 10 o'clock at night because they're pulling the plug on you and you have to go over and fucking tap dance and get the thing back on. And I did, and we shot the next day and it's fine. But it's like, I've always, that's one of those crystal, crystalline moments in my memory whenever I get in the like, oh, I'm mad because producer XYZ, publisher XYZ did this other thing. I'm like, you still have the career everyone wishes they had and maybe you should shut up. <laughs> you know? I, I had a, a meeting with a publisher um, a few weeks ago. Um, day before my birthday, so a little over two weeks ago. And uh, I'm sort of, I'm trying to move in a, a different direction at the moment because I've been doing like a lot of kids content for a while and I'm doing right. some other stuff. You know? And so I, and I've got a lot of ideas. So I went into this meeting with seven different things to pitch to them, uh, all comic books. And I pitched all seven and they emailed me an hour later, and they said, uh, "We're gonna we're gonna talk things over, but we're very interested in four of them." And when my husband asked me how it went, I said, it, "Honestly, it went really badly. Like three of the ideas they just hated." <laughs> That's a fucking classic. And awesome. I know I'm broken. Like I know I'm a broken human being, but also on the on the drinking thing, every time I'm unfocused, my husband will come in and pour wine and be like, "You just need more writing juice. You'll be fine." <laughs> yeah, for me, coffee is the writing juice. I get very unproductive. Uh, you know, when I, when the, I drink. you know the the comparison is a, is the thief of joy. There's there's like I think two rules ahead of that because that, that's from. Uh, uh, Musashi, I, I believe it's uh, Musashi, he's a famous uh, samurai, like at 61, he wrote out this philosophy of life. And it, I think it was like 21 rules or something like that. I, yeah, don't, don't quote me. Um, uh, but his first rule is um, accept things 
as they are, you know? And that is probably the most important part of everything that follows afterwards, you know, comparison and all the other things that he talks about. Because, you know, by being able to accept things as they are, uh, you're able to basically know where you're at and where mm -hmm. you need to go and uh, hopefully calm, calmly just sort of approach those goals. The thing about goals is like once you achieve one goal, there's, there's another goal. It's kind of like the Simpsons episodes where Homer is eating the power sauce bars and those guys from the power sauce company come over. They're like, oh yeah, we want you to, to climb the murder horn, you know, because uh, he's all pumped up from the power sauce bars. And he's like, the murder horn? He's like, yeah, you mean that mountain over there? And it's, he's, you know, it's pretty substantial mountain. And they're like, no, 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 to the right of that. You know, he's like, oh, he's like, keep going. It's the one right next to it. And it's like higher and higher. He's like, oh, you know, so, <laughs> so the, the goals are always like, you know, go, the goals are moving, they're moving goalposts, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why, you know, the idea of, you know, the journey being the thing comes into play, you know, but the, the, the journey, you know, being able to accept that, that uh, this area where you're not getting necessarily the praise, you're not necessarily getting uh, the crit, the, the critique, you know, but you're in the process of making the work and that process can be a long time. Um, you have to get comfortable within that, you know, and then remember that at some point you have to shift gears and go, oh, you know, once this thing is done, I got to actually promote this thing and I have to put my promoting hat on. I have to uh, go on, do interviews. I got to put my interview hat on. You know, it's like this whole uh, constellation of things that that are connected to the core, which is the, the work and the creativity, you know, but, mm -hmm. but being able to maintain and to control the conditions in which creativity is possible, that's like, you know, that's really the overall, the overarching uh, uh, goal, you know, yeah. being able to keep a, you know, honey nut Cheerios in the, in the larder, you know, being yeah. able to pay the bills and, and have your your cable and your internet, you know, all of those things, you know, the process of, of, of uh, all those things of being able to, to create that the environment in which you can sit down and actually, you know, tap into that thing that lies outside, you know, and then to be able to incorporate that, to filter that into the work, you know, um, it's tough to do, you know, especially with, with artists because artists are very um, technical, mm -hmm. you know, they're not thinking beyond the technique, you know, they're not thinking about the, you know, of, uh, you know, the other things that they could be tapping into, like, you know, kind of like poetry is, Poetry is a, is a kind of creation that taps into a higher uh, reasoning, a higher functioning, you know, part of our brains, you know, compared to, you know, chiseling a marble statue or something like that. You know, there's a lot of technique that goes into the marble statue. So in a roundabout way, you know, I'm, I'm just basically saying that, you know, uh, you know, creativity is at the core, you know, and being able to be creative, you have to control your conditions you know, you have to control the conditions in, yeah. in which creativity is possible. And then how you navigate those waters in order to do that. Do you have to work at Starbucks? Do you have to do that? Maybe you do, you know, because at the end of the night, you'll have an hour to 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 create. And it's not a question of, of whether you're going to do it or not when you're at this level. You know, you're going to do it. You know, you'll mm -hmm. be tired and maybe you'll stretch it to an hour and a half, you know, wake up really tired the next morning. But it's not going to stop you. You know, just don't stop. Never stop never stopping as they say well, well, I, I, I I agree that we get into trouble with shoulds right it should be this way I you mm -hmm. know the that publisher should have liked the other three ideas right um, and, and it's like I'd said it's like the the you know the the goalpost on should moves every time you know as as, as soon as it's you know well I, I should be a professional you know comic book writer and, and and once I am well it's like well I should be writing for Marvel right and then once you're writing for Marvel it's like well you know I should be doing this I should be running a TV show I should be should 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 should. Um, and and should and, and and should can be a bad thing. It can be a good thing because if you have no aspirations, you know, if you have no drive, then you, you know you're 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 never going to climb that mountain. 
right? The I think the tricky part is being able to find the joy when you hit those markers, even yeah. even as you set the next marker. Mm. You know well, what I mean? Yeah, I, I I think that's an important point, and and what you what you do with the defeat, also, you know, like because. I think that that should can can destroy us, right? I mean, it's it's almost like a fire, right? And so and so it can maybe I've said this before, but it can it can rage out of control, and it can completely consume us, just burn us into nothing, right? And and then we fall flat on our face, and we accomplish nothing. Or you can harness that fire and use it as like fucking rocket fuel, right? And that can propel you to the the moon, like like falling flat on your face can be the best thing that ever happened to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I, I think we all experienced a version of it with COVID. I certainly did where it was like, I had two books that were about to be published by, by major publishers. They were going to be announced. Um, and then COVID hit, it was pencils down. People started getting fired everywhere. And suddenly my books were, were done. Right. And, uh, and, and I did not have a book in a comic shop last year. Um, and that was yeah. fucking devastating to me. And, and, and it could, it, it, it could have just killed me. Right. But, and, and it killed me for a minute. Um, and then I picked myself up off the fucking ground and I'm like, well, I have these books. Now what? Right. And, and I used all that anger, all that angst, all that sadness. And I, I did something with it. And, and now one of those books is coming out in August. And, and for the first time I'm like, okay, well, comic shops, traditional publishing, it's not open right now. What do I do? And I moved on to Kickstarter. Now suddenly I'm, you know, three Kickstarters later, uh, I am a name on Kickstarter and I'm getting more attention because of my Kickstarters than I have my, you know, even my, my, uh, my comic shop books. And now I have this entire other side of my, uh, of, of my, my, my career and, 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 and my, my game and my tools. And, uh, and so I think that's important. You know what I'm saying? Like you're going to get knocked down. And so, so then, then what happens, right? Well, I mean, success the, can throw you off too, you know? Success yeah. Success well, I was going to, I was going to bring that up actually about your point that what you were saying about making time to, for the creativity versus making time for all of the things that are around the creativity. Uh, you know, my buddy Eastman sold the Ninja Turtles because he was no longer a cartoonist. He was now a, CEO of a multi-million dollar international business and he had no time he didn't draw for a long time you know a man you know like at the height of the you know career and talent of one of the you know world changing cartoonists he was like I spend all day fighting lawsuits when people rip off the turtles in foreign countries and approving toy lines and approving scripts for the animated series and I'd like to just go back to writing you know Drawing comic books was actually what I wanted to do. It's also why you get sophomore slumps. You know, people put 18 years of their life or 25 years of their life or 50 years into the, of their life into that first novel, that first album. Mm -hmm. And then the publisher, record company, movie studio comes along and says, okay, now you have six months to do that exact thing that took you your entire life to build up to. I think Elvis Costello... I think Elvis Costello said that once. He said all first albums are take 18 to 25 years to make, and then they make that person do the next album in three months. And it's like, it's not going to be good because you didn't spend 18 years thinking about it, and it's not every idea you ever had. Or maybe every idea you ever had was into that, you know, that first album, and maybe you didn't have a second idea. You know, look at uh, uh, Harper Lee. Look at Truman mm. Capote. It's like, uh, you know, Dashiell Hammett didn't write his first short story, and it was his third career. He didn't write his first short story until as well into his 30s. And by the time he was 45, his writing career was over forever, and he didn't know it. Mm. He was still making money. He was still getting hired to do the occasional thing, but he wrote five novels. That's it. Nobody gives a shit about his radio scripts that weren't very good. Nobody gives a shit about his ghostwriting Hollywood screenplay stuff. The most influential writer in a single genre produced five novels in it over a period of only, it's like six years that he writes those novels. And then he is done forever. And I imagine, what if you walked up to him at age 43 and said, you've written your last novel? He would have blown his brains out. You know? I mean, the... The reality of the situation is if you make one good thing as a creative person, you're lucky. Yep. You know, if you make one good thing, 
then you know what as a as an artist you're up there you yep. know if, you know not everyone can be prince you know prince has got at least in my personal opinion he's got like at least a period of like 10 years of just churning out an album a year practically mm -hmm. and all of them were just amazing you know not everyone was on board for most of that stuff but the people who were into the sound they they followed along and then there was the resurgence when you know the the you know when he comes back with you know uh, albums and people are like oh my god you know they rediscover prince you know you know the my artistic personal my my personal artistic philosophy is 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 inspired by john carpenter prince and sonic youth and <laughs> at the core the of i mean at the core of all of these people is the work Mm -hmm. And they just continue the work. They continue to work, and they they control a lot of the work, you know. Um, and they make you know they it's a lifestyle, you know. It really is a lifestyle thing, you know. If somebody doesn't like what you're doing, I mean, it it's kind of weird because I mean there are people out there who really try, and they're not that great, and they keep on trying, they keep on trying. Um, I mean, I I guess the the, the advice is still the same: keep on doing it because you never know, you know. What, what I might think is not so great could be the next million dollar hit. You know, yeah. you look at these NFTs and you're sitting there and you're thinking, dude, I'm a fool. You know, <laughs> why am I sitting here spending 30 years trying to learn anatomy when some guy on a computer, you know, he's just like, okay, well, you know, we're going to put this little image of Mario and he's going to be jumping onto the mushroom and that's going to sell for $500,000. You know, it's like, okay, you know, am I supposed to be like so uh despondent because of the reality is the situation that i stopped working no you just got to keep on you know got to keep on going and at the end of the day the work will exist it'll it'll exist outside of you it'll you know right it'll be it'll be in the world you know in the you know it, and it's important that it exists outside of you in a way that a script you know like rylan was saying that you know a script will be on a shelf and it's like who cares somebody comes up with an idea that's very similar to that and you're like oh dude you know, I had the matrix right here, you know, but if you put it out in a book form, this is like a side, it's kind of like a deviation from the no, actual topic. Fine. But, you know, the thing about making these books is like, you're like, well, wait a second, you know, right here, dude, you know, yeah. like uh, my first book, Almighty, was basically uh, uh, female Mad Max. Um, and this was published eight years before we even saw the first trailer of Fury Road, you know. And I'll always be able to sit there as I'm watching Fury Road. I'm sitting there and I, you know, we were trying to set it up. We had uh, directors connected and, and uh, Ken Nolan, uh, the writer of the screenplay for uh, Black Hawk Down, had done three drafts on spec. And uh, it just never went anywhere because that producer was a total failure, you know. Um, but I'm sitting there in the movie theater and thinking, yes, this is great because now this is the proof of concept of what I've already done. And, uh, but my thing exists eight years before this, right? You know, and, you know, making the work, creating the work, and it's outside of you, you'll always have that, you can always sell that too. So, you know, continue working, you know, maintain the conditions in which you can do that, you know, and then everything else is everything else, you just have to address it as it comes. Right. Another one of my favorite quotes from Christopher McQuarrie's uh, script for The Way of the Gun. And these are words to live by. It's such a great movie. It's such an underrated movie. But one of the greatest, and, and Ryan, uh, Ryan Phillippe absolutely swallows this line. I don't think I would have even noticed it if I didn't look on the IMDb. A plan is just a list of things that aren't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking and I'm a big planner. I'm a guy who makes plans all the time. I I live and die by the to do list. But uh, you know, I'm also a military history student my whole life. And if there's one lesson to be learned, why Ulysses S. Grant was better at it than anyone else in history up to that point, is that he was the guy that when the plan went wrong, he didn't go. Oh, the plan's going wrong. He was like, "Okay, this is this is just another damn thing I have to deal with." Okay, right. the ability to adapt in the face of, "Oh, hmm, that wasn't on my list of things that were going to happen when I did that, but I guess I will now figure out 
how to adapt to this new set of circumstances. If you can't adapt to the new set of circumstances, you are toast. And that is true in absolutely every field of human endeavor. To me, that that's all film directing is. It's a set of improv challenges thrown at you. I mean, and there are, you know, there are people operating out there with limitless money and limitless time. You know, uh, a friend of mine worked on Hook. And the reason Hook is a is a complete fucking mess is he said Spielberg showed up every day and was like, what are we going to, what will we shoot today? Like no script, no nothing. And it was just, they were improvising. And that's the danger of having unlimited time of, and money is the, there was no plan. There was no plan to even go wrong and then be adapted to. There was just the plan was on fire in the corner. Uh, and guess what? Even Steven Spielberg needs a plan. Iron Man 2 is the same thing. They had such a great success with Iron Man. Favreau and, and Downey Jr. are like, ah, we'll improvise our way through a $200 million action movie. Turns out, you actually can't do that and come up with something watchable. Turns out. <laughs> like you, It's cute on an indie movie, and you can do it when you have a really well-structured screenplay that you're riffing on, but take away the steak and leave the sizzle, and you, you have something that's not a meal. Mm. And so that's the, you know, we'd all like to be cursed with Spielberg's time and resources, but, you know, hold on to the lesson of have a plan, be willing to change the plan, uh, be willing to change your mind about anything. I mean, the worst, the worst thing for a creative person, I think is aside from paying the rent is, uh, inflexibility mm -hmm. is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm always just baffled by the people who don't, you know, if you're on the set and the PA has a really great idea, shoot it. <laughs> They're not winning the Oscar. <laughs> you know, like what, what, what's, what's the problem, man? Take the, take everybody's advice. And that's the, I think the really successful artists and the best artists are the improvisers that are not like, there are exceptions to that rule. The, the Coen brothers are the most obvious, like there will be no improvising. We work on the script for a year and it's perfect before we get around to shooting it. There's a story about, um, what's his name? Jeff Bridges doing Lebowski. And it was his first Coen brothers movie in a weekend. He's like, where are the, yellow pages where are the blue pages and john goodman was like script's done buddy script was done before we met you <laughs> and we're going to shoot it and it's going to be great and there will be no yellow pages we will not be changing our minds about anything that we're doing but again it's a different working style of getting if i worked on scripts longer i would be probably less improvisational by the time I'm getting to the lettering draft and going, no, that could change. Um, I mean, this, is, this is the hardest thing about being an artist and a writer is that like, when I first started working for publishers, I got very nervous, you know, I mean, I was in my twenties, so I was nervous about everything always, but like, I would, I would, I would send a script and then I'd be like, I'm going to draw it now. And everything changes when you're actually drawing it and you might it, 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 even little things like you might just redesign a page or you might just throw in some big new whatever and i'm like this is an impossible process to do if i'm having to wait if i'm having to be like i've had a really good idea oh, let me yeah. send an email and say that i've had it and it's i think it's it's one of the like it's it's such a i think so many people think that everything is as prescriptive and planned as 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 it comes out mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I think a, that is a that is a big misunderstanding that audiences have about art is that it's all I meant to do that. It's like, mm -hmm. but it's not just, of, just audiences though too. It's yeah. artists. You know, there's the, there's the whole idea of workflow. You know, being able to understand, like, okay, there's the there are a lot of different stages. You know, and a lot of different passes when you're working on something, mm -hmm. and you have to be really comfortable with that. You know, like. For me personally, I like to sort of like, like I have multiple ideas that have been, you know, kind of, you know, uh, percolating on the back burner for, for decades, you know, and I have sketchbooks. Sometimes I'll get a, like a piece of dialogue and I'll write it down. I'll be, oh, that's perfect for that, you know, or I'll have a sketch, you know, and then, oh, that might be great for this idea, you know. So a lot of these ideas take a long time to, to get to a place where you're ready to execute them. 
and there's a lot of uh, you have to have a lot of uh, open-minded thinking going into that because then once you you know for instance like uh, the warning I had basically an idea of where I was going to take the story but then uh, I just started drawing it you know because mm -hmm. I do storyboards so I visually tell the story you know I know how long I want to stay in the scene just by the visuals, right? And then I, I sprinkle the words and the uh, descriptive text on, on, on afterwards. That's a pass, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's many different passes, you know? And having the idea of workflow and a structure within the within the workflow, uh, workflow and being okay with it and sort of like, uh, you know, just, just being okay with the process is like a big deal. You know, there are a lot of artists who, are, who don't approach the work in that way. You know, a lot of professional artists because a client is coming in and they're saying, um, uh, well, you know, work for work made for hire and creative work is, is different for me. You know, work made for hire, I don't get personally involved in that stuff. You know, I, I don't agonize over that stuff. You know, I just do the work that the client wants. But the stuff that I do for myself, I have infinite time for, and I make infinite time for, and it's just a process, you know. And and nobody gets to see it until it's done, mm -hmm. you know. I don't, I don't want to hear anybody's opinion about the first chapter of a book that's going to be a hundred chapters. It's like, well, you don't know where it's going. I don't care, you know. So, it, it's just workflow. It's just managing how you approach the work as an artist, as a creative. And being able to stay sane and patient and and just moving forward. And those aren't even steps to success. That's just living as an artist. Right. You know, I don't know what it takes to be a success, you know. Um, well, there's one thing I know is you got to have the work done. You know, you can't be a success without work. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. so control what you can make the work get through making the work and then see, see what happens next and then keep on working. Well, you know, the, what, what uh, you're saying about, you know, when you're working for hire within uh, with editors, with publishers, with clients who are approving things, I do tend to get like, I have to fight myself sometimes to not care when I get a bad note that I actually have to respond to and go, okay. And a lot of times it's like, this great idea will now belongs to me. <laughs> you have thrown it away and now I can use it in my own work. Uh, but that said, you know, the best thing is when your coworkers from, you know, your creative coworkers, if you're like me, a writer who just, you know, doesn't draw a thing and you have artists and a letterer and a colorist, and you also have editors and publishers. And in my case, some, a lot of times license holders, if you can establish trust, where they trust you to, they trust you to make that journey. They trust you to do that process. Because every once in a while, I'll be on the third issue of a four issue miniseries or something for Dy Dynamite. And I look, I go back and look at my pitch and I'm like, this bears no resemblance to what you guys, <laughs> I, I, I veered away from this thing that you guys approved so long ago and nobody noticed and nobody said anything to me about it and good. I mean, every once in a while, a change is so big that I'm like, let me just send an email saying, I'm actually going to kill that guy in issue three and we're never going to see him again in case anybody, <laughs> in case anybody's mad at that, uh, that's what's going to happen. But 99% of the time, I literally just, you know, I let the story go where it's going to go and then go back and look at the pitch and I'm like, that's what it seemed like before I wrote a word of it, but that's <laughs> never how it really works. Like, you know... Outlines are great. Maps are great. Maps are not voyages. You know, outlines are, you know, outlines are suggestions. And you you have to, you have to adapt to the things as they come up. Otherwise, you're making something that's dead. I like that. Um, Maps are not voyages. That, that's pretty, that's a very. That's, thank you. <laughs> I had a, 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 there was, I was working on two books for this for the same publisher, and one of them was just a real battle 
Uh, we, we couldn't kind of find the tone of it. It was meant to be a novel series when we first pitched it, and they came back and said, Richard, you do comics. Could you do this one as a comic too? Oh, and I said, cool, yep. Uh, that's a bit of a rewrite. Because um, I don't know if you guys know this, novels and comics yeah. have very different pacing. Um, but so, but that one was just like, like a real, uh, an uphill battle the whole way through. And I really got into this, this headspace where I thought that I must need this much like back and forth with the other book as well. And I wasn't getting any um, notes. And I kept thinking that I was just being like ignored. And finally I, I, I reached out and I was like, when, when are the notes coming on? It was actually book two of, um, of Black Sand Beach. And they said, oh no, 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 no. You're good to you do what you want with that one. We know you're fine. You you just make that book. And I was nice. like, oh, oh, that's right. Cause I made, I made, I made the first one and they liked it. So I can just make the second one and, and it'll be okay. But like, it's so easy to get, you know, you, you do lose, uh, you lose the ability to know whether something is working or not when you're the only voice in your head. Mm. I always mm. feel like I, I feel, I mean, I'm an egomaniac, so I always feel like it's working. My only question is, does anybody else feel like it's working? Are they going to like it? <laughs> like is really, when I handed in my first ever comic script, I had never done it before. And after all these years in Hollywood, I was expecting notes. And after a week of dead silence, I called up another colleague who was working for Dynamite at the time. And he was like, yeah, they're not really a notes organization. <laughs> like they're putting out too many comics and they have too many, they have too small a staff. Uh, they're very much in the Don Draper. That's what the money is for way of doing things. It's like, no, you're, you're the writer. You write it, you do that part and we'll do the binding it and putting it in stores part. And that's our agreement with one another. Right. And that's great uh, for me. I don't, I don't, need publisher notes or editor notes uh necessarily uh but it's still after hollywood it was definitely an adjustment but the scale is so much smaller you know the budget for the budget for a comic book is the craft not even the craft service budget on an independent film mm -hmm. you know it's it is chump change and they have a hard time recouping it that's the amazing part <laughs> so you know well you you i you know, your notes are from the uh, consumer, right? Because, like, at the end of the day, art is communication, you know? So so you can uh, you can finish art, you know, you can do stay at home and do your art, but it's not complete until the uh, the audience gets a chance to look at it, right? That it's, that's when the whole thing is, is done, you know? So the reaction and, uh, you know, the criticism, you know, those are your notes. You know, and it's 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 difficult because sometimes you can create something, and uh, it, it you know how it's taken in is limited by what that person who's critiquing it is bringing into it. You know, so there's a part of you that's sort of like when I look at the work, I know what I've done. Okay. And I don't know what's more important. Is it more important that I know what I've done or how it's received? Mm. You know, um, I guess maybe it's a back and forth type of situation. You know, some sometimes, I mean, maybe the overall thing is how, you know, how it makes you feel, and, you know, what you feel like you've done for, with the work, you know, but it's, it's great to have an audience respond in the way that you would hope them to respond. But if, you, but, but if you want that, and if you go for that, you're lost forever because the audience is fickle, you know, and you can never guess, you know, when your work comes out, what the audience is, is in the mood for, you know, all you can do is create the work and just kind of like, this is it. These are my balls. What do you think of my balls? You know, uh, you don't like them, you like them, some of them like them, some of you don't. And hopefully that's not such a powerful psychological um, moment that it stops you from going forward yeah. and well, to con continue to create. Well, that's the whole thing of like, you're talking about how you've got so many different ideas and so many things percolating over time, like a bit, and you have to have the work. Like the more times you have someone like or dislike your work, 
the less powerful that becomes as a thing that might stop you. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Ed. Um, you were talking before about like the work that is your work, no one else is gonna see it or judge it until it is done, you know. But you're also talking about like fitting in that hour at the end of each day or fitting in the thing. Do you find like I so I I find that like my best work is when I can get obsessed with something and when I can like be like for the next three months, all I'm doing is this thing. Do you find it hard to like go back and forth between things or like find little, you know, do you lose flow on the, 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 the big project? No, right. um, I think what happens is that because I, I maintain sketchbooks and I, I uh, put down notes and ideas and stuff like that, um, I get to a place where I'm thinking, okay, what do I want to work on next? You know, and the project will tell you, you know, it's a very small, you know, the signals are there. They're very tiny and they're very delicate, you know, but the project will tell you when, when it's ready. You know, it's like, so for instance, um, during the pandemic, all of 2020, I was working on a reimagining of my second book that I self-published called Waveform. And Waveform was about this alternative lifestyle guru who thinks that sexual desire in men is a weakness. And he's created a philosophy to, 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 to deal with that. And there's a group of people who, who want to stop him, you know, and all throughout 2020, you know, I was working on that stuff, you know, and I came to a point towards the end of 2020 where I was sitting there and I was thinking, you know what? The world has changed so much that this story doesn't work. You know, it's the kind of pretentious idea that people aren't really interested in right now, you know, because things have become so reduced to like simple pleasures and simple things like getting together and, you know, being with someone that you love, you know, the idea of these kind of more high minded, you know, sort of pretentious ideas. That's, you know, people want meat and potatoes right now. You know, they want to be entertained, you know, they want mac and cheese, you know. So I stopped working on that project and jumped onto a project that was all laid out and ready to go. But it mm. was all laid out and ready to go because I had previously worked on it and I was able to just, you know, take that hat off and put on a whole, a whole new hat. Now, the idea of like jumping off of something, I've already had like 60, 70 pages of that the waveform done. That's the hard part, you know, sit, sitting there and realizing and listening to to the work and, and knowing that the work is like, look, you know, this is not the time for me right now, you know, and being able to find the work that where you're like, you know what, this is the time for this now, you know, that's, that's the tricky part, you know, but all of that stuff is possible only because of the work that, that goes into it prior to actually doing it. So have at least four or five ideas that you're continually de developing, you know, mm -hmm. And then at some point that idea would tell you, hey, I'm ready to go. And then you go. Yeah. But but at the same time, never be so stubborn or never be so stiff in your in your creative thought that you can't jump off of that thing when when it's not right. Well, I guess what I'm more more curious about though is like once you are working on an idea, have like I, I think part of the reason that I hate doing publicity so much and I hate doing all the extra hustle around it um, is because like, uh, okay, like uh, here's an example, which isn't about publicity, but it's just part of the reason I've been in a weird mood today. Uh, I have spent the past three days reinstalling uh, operating systems on a computer over and over again to try and get the right combination to make my scanner work and Photoshop work because they will not operate on the same system. And all it's right, been so a um, Epson have removed the functionality of photo scanning uh, from from all of their new products, like the actual like the photo quality scanning, where it yeah. gives you nice soft color, and they're um, after four hours on the phone with them, their answer was, "Well, we think the new way of scanning looks better because it's sort of crisper. It won't work for photos, but that's fine." And I'm like, "But I I do a lot of th things with markers, and I need you know, anyway. It's fine. That's a whole other anger. But like, on, I'm sitting here. All I want to be doing is working on the book that I have." I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a new book. I started work on it on Sunday. I've drawn one page. I started penciling the second page on Monday morning. 
And here we are on Thursday. I know that like, I know that I would have made better work if I had been able to do that right through. I know that by the end of next week, I would have issue one drawn and it would be the best version of it. Now, because of these three days out and because of the next probably day and a half still being out doing it, I know that that break is not going to make the work better. It's going to mean I've lost that flow. I'm not going to, you know, and you're, you know, when you're, I'm saying, I'm asking more about like, if you're working, you're working your day job doing storyboards, you're coming home, you're doing, or, well, I guess pandemic, you're probably staying home and then like switching onto a different project that every day back and forth switch, how do you avoid like all, all the craziness that I'm currently going through? How, do, how does that, how does that, how do you get back into that state quickly, I guess? Well, think of yourself as a surfer, okay? Like most surfers, I always do. They have a, yeah. <laughs> you know, they have day Clearly. jobs, you know, yeah. but they make time to surf, right? So they go out there in the morning or, you know, after work or something like that. And, you know, the, the surfing, you know, the wave is the creativity, right? So you're out there. And every wave is not going to be that that creative wave that you could ride to shore. You know, there are a mm -hmm. lot of waves that kind of start up and peter off. You know, there's a lot of waves that just don't come in. Some days it's not happening. But the most important thing about it is to, sh to go to the beach, to get into the water. You know, um, that's the only uh, broad answer to what yeah. you're asking, which is basically show up, you know. Yeah. Yes, your workflow has been uh, disrupted, you know, but that doesn't mean uh, that you won't be able to catch the next creative wave on Thursday that takes you yeah. all the way to shore, you know, yeah. but you, you certainly won't catch it if you're not at the beach, you know, and just caught up in all the superfluous nonsense of you know, not surfing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the so a, a, a real world, uh, you know, a, a, a less metaphorical answer to that for me is I just reread the project up to the point I stopped. I dive in and I read everything again. Doesn't take that long. You know, comic book scripts aren't that long. I had a situation this year. I had written issue two of a four issue series and handed it in first week in February. I got pencils down on issue three, a couple of, you know, a couple of weeks later, I was way ahead of the artist. So there was no, like they didn't even start drawing issue one yet. So I had all the time in the world to write, write three. And they told me to take a little time because the pandemic stuff. Then they said pencils down. In October, they're like, hey, where, how's issue three coming along? And I was like, wow, that's like a, a different guy wrote those two issues. And I don't know what the hell to tell you about this last two issues. But I kept that to myself and I sat down and I reread one and two and I went, hey, it's pretty good stuff. And, but I definitely was like anything I might've had in mind for three and four, whatever I was thinking about February 17th was, I'm not going to remember that. Uh, but the new me had ideas for the last two issues and I wrote them. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a very different comic than it would have been probably had I had I finished it uh, in March, had I written three yeah. and four in February and March. But to me, the jump back on, there's a, Kurosawa wrote an autobiography that is helpfully called something like an autobiography. And the whole thing is about his childhood up until his first job. And then his appendix, which is so harsh and hilarious. He says, I know you bought this book to read about filmmaking and you're really disappointed right now because I didn't talk about filmmaking at all. Here's six pages of brutal filmmaking advice that you're going to listen to or you're going to be a failure. It's a really funny book. I will tell you that in all of my filmmaking life, I have quoted those six pages a billion times because there is gold in there. One of his more difficult ideas, and I don't endorse this, but it's connected to what I just was talking about. He talks about taking notes all the time. Every time he's like, you read a book, you should have a notebook open because a book is going to make you read, think about things in your own creative life. It's going to give you ideas. You should write them down. He also says, before you sit down to try to screenplay, read all of those notebooks. 
read every notebook you have ever taken in your entire life because I swear to God there's something in there you need and you don't know you need it. So reread everything. That is, of course, crazy town to a certain degree. But as I've gotten older, I do now sort of keep organized files of all of those notes I've ever had. And if something is tangentially connected to another thing, I will go back and read another, you know, a, what seems to be like an unrelated notebook and go like, maybe there's something in here that I can draw out from there. But uh, we have we have hit over the 90 minute mark and we should probably uh, wrap this up. It's been a terrific, really, this is the longest we've ever stayed on a topic, I think. Uh, but it's really <laughs> do we now good. do we now switch over to the casual banter part? Yeah, now we talk yeah, about, talk about nice <laughs> yeah. uh, but thank you guys so much. Uh, we end with uh, telling people where we can find you and uh, what you're up to next. So, Ed, how about you? Where where can people find you and follow you and buy your books and etc.? I'm on Instagram, Ed underscore LaRoche. I'm online at edlaroche.com. Uh, working on a new book called The Cult. And uh, yeah, there you go. I'm on Facebook too. Not too many nice. Ed LaRoche's on there. <laughs> nice. And uh, Richard? Uh, I'm on Instagram as Richard Fairgray author. Um, I'm on Twitter as Richard Fairgray, where I'm very funny and I, I would say very underappreciated. Uh, for how hilarious I am. Uh, probably the most underappreciated of anyone ever, I think. Um, yes. <laughs> sometimes I get up to I get up to one like. So I'm very proud of that. And that's, um, usually, that's usually me. And you and Black yeah. Sand Beach two uh, is in Black Sand Beach. Yeah, Black Sand Beach one out. and two are now out. Um, two two books that are 192 pages each. They are everywhere, Amazon, bookshop.org, um, any bookstore, any comic store, they're available through Diamond. They are everywhere from uh, Pixel and Ink as the publisher. And if you want any of my older stuff, I think the Golden Apple Blastosaurus run is probably still available. And I do children's books. And uh, I, I mean, if you if you find me on any uh, forums complaining about Epson scanners, that's that's the same Richard Fairgright. You wouldn't believe it. And Ryland. Amazing. Yeah. I, before I get into my spiel, yeah, let me, uh, let me wholeheartedly recommend Black Sand Beach. Uh, uh, I, I love the, uh, the first volume. The second volume is, is currently speeding uh, towards me and I'm looking forward to it. So definitely order that. Uh, I am, uh, I am Rylan Grant. I am at Rylan Grant uh, on all forms of social media. That's R-Y-L-E-N-D-G-R-A-N-T. I spell it because it's not a real name. My parents drunkenly arranged letters. And so now I have to spell it for you. Um, I, uh, yeah, uh, my books, uh, the Ringo award winning Aberrants mm -hmm. and the four time Ringo nominated Banjax are available in fine comic shops everywhere and on Amazon and Comixology and wherever you, uh, you know, buy your books. Uh, you can get my, um, paranoid astral projection thriller, The Jump and my Fargo S crime drama, The Peacekeepers, uh, now via backer kit. If you go to thejump2.backerkit.com, uh, you'll find plenty of copies of those things and signed copies of Banjax and Aberrant and all sorts of uh, unique convariants and stuff like that. So it's kind of the uh, Ryland Grant shop right now. So check that out if you're interested. Uh, yeah, that's nice. it. And awesome. I, my work can be found at davidavalonefreelance.com. Um Links to all of the things, the social medias, etc. cetera. Uh, I, like Ryland, I was heartbroken to be out of comic shops for a solid year. But I have an Elvira meets Vincent Price miniseries that's going to drop in a couple of months. I think that it'll finally be, be in previews uh, probably next month. Um, finishing up the second volume of Drawing Blood, my creator-owned thing with Kevin Eastman, which right now is... Uh, Kickstarter fans only, but as soon as they have it, the second volume and first volume will be out as trade paperbacks, uh, and then we'll start working on the third one. Um, and yeah, and a couple of other Elvira specials, because apparently that's uh, what I do now is write a lot of uh, Elvira, uh, who is uh, delightful, and I'm happy to that apparently the voice of a, you know, 1980s burlesque star uh, comes naturally to me. 
uh, make of that what you will. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for joining us, guys. It was a really terrific talk. And we'll see everyone else on the next exciting episode of The Writer's Block. Thanks for listening, guys. Cheers. See ya. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or other fine purveyors of ear crack, please leave us a five-star review. And wherever you're watching and or listening, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We'll see you back here next week for more madcap hijinks on The Writer's Block.